Isn't Life Curious is brought to you by the kind support of fans just like you. Donate to support the show and get access to members-only content, early episodes, exclusive merch, behind-the-scenes content, and more at patreon.com slash isn't life curious. What is this place? What's the soils like? What are the plants that are here? What's the rainfall? What's the ecological systems here? Let's make this system hyperactive and utilize it. This whole entire planet is one gigantic garden. Everything is almost everything is edible or it's medicinal. It's useful in some way. So no matter where you go, this is my diet. Yeah. yeah. What time of year is it? This is my diet. Yep. And human beings have evolved, adapted, created. However, we got here. We've been this way for zillions of years. We are capable of living within our environment, no matter where we are, um, and being healthy. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you freaks, mutations. You're a prophet of decentralization. To reestablish a cosmic context for landfall. To search and striving for truth and knowledge. There will be a degeneration of ideas. What kind of place is this? Hey everybody, this is Jason Wilson with Isn't Life Curious? Life is a curious thing. Let's explore it together. And today I'm really, really excited to be sitting down with somebody who uh, I read his book a long time ago, very inspiring to me. I'm here with Mark Shepard of uh, New Forest Farms, Restoration Agriculture, and uh, I know you've got some other projects going on now too. Mark, thanks so much for being willing to come on the podcast today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to kind of prime everybody's brains here today, what we're going to be discussing, at, you know, we've already kind of gone through some big topics around what it means to be alive on this planet Earth as humans. And we've talked about some big topics around, you know, is life special? How did life come about in the universe? All this sort of thing. Today, we're talking about how humans are living on the planet actively and uh, specifically around um, how we're sustaining ourselves. And so this concept of uh, regenerative agriculture or sustainable agriculture, permaculture, buzzwords that have been floating around um, more and more and more as time goes on. And so I wanted everyone to have the chance to learn about Mark's story, which is uh, really, really uh, special and fascinating. Uh, we were just talking right before we hit record that what's awesome about his story is that it's not theoretical, it's pragmatic. Um, you've implemented some amazing uh, things to try to find a better way forward in uh, how we uh, sustain ourselves on this planet. So uh, to kind of introduce people to your work and, and everything like that, do you mind sharing a little bit, Mark, of um, how did you come about uh, deciding to dedicate your life into trying to find a better way forward in terms of, I, I keep wanting to say agriculture, but it's more than agriculture. It's really just about living on this planet, how we sustain ourselves. Right. Yeah. How do, how do we live here? How do we live on planet Earth? We all of a sudden drop you off on planet X somewhere. You kind of wake yeah. up, you look around. How do you actually live there without screwing it up? And <laughs> actually, I better, I better watch out because... Um, you know, I spend a lot of time out in the farm. I hang out with animals. I hang out with equipment that breaks every once in a while. So I'm quite, uh, quite familiar with the usage of the F word and all these other things. So <laughs> I'll try to catch myself whenever I can. So yeah, how do, how do I live on this planet without screwing it up? That's, that's a big question. <laughs> and now that we live on a planet that pretty well is, oh, say, pushing 40 to 50% of it right now has been denuded by our agricultural practices. It's in annual crops. Um, the oceans and the sky and the soil and our food is radioactive. There's plastic particles absolutely everywhere. Yep. The air that you breathe today is not the air that our grandfathers and great grandfathers, grandmothers breathed back in the 1820s. This is a radically different planet right here, right now. And it works a certain way. And if, and if we understand how it actually works, how it actually works, not how we think that it works, <laughs> or what YouTube University says that it works, how does it actually work? And then if we figure out how to go along with those processes, we can actually help this planet be a better place than it is now. Because right now, you know, 
how many uh, billions of people are either starving or in concentration camps, refugee camps, or in war zones right now? Um, yeah. No joke. Uh, like 60% yep. of the human race doesn't even exist within the economy. So, oh, all we need is more jobs and higher, better education. That's <laughs> not true. We need to learn how to live on this planet the way this planet actually works. And, and if our culture doesn't come in line with that, we're going to go the way of, of all of the species that overshoot their, their, uh, their habitat carrying capacity. And, you know, that's, that's bye-bye. And usually it's pretty ugly when bye-bye happens. Yep. It usually seems like things are going fine for a while. And then the uh, ecosystem collapse, you know, the, the cascading series of ecosystem collapse that come, it's uh, it seems tolerable. It seems tolerable, and then all of a sudden, it's no yeah. longer tolerable, and then it's isn't too it, late to do much about it. Isn't it really beautiful? You live in such a wonderful place out there in Portland, Oregon. Nice balmy weather, fifties to seventy <laughs> degrees, cloudy, plenty of rain. How's the weather out there, by the way? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, so where I am, in, I'm in Southern Oregon, so ah. we get extra extra heat. Uh, so it's um very deserty and getting worse every every year as far as uh the intensity i think we had a hundred and we hit 113 i think yesterday cool <laughs> <laughs> so yeah well all right so and let's go right to this on the science of it oh that's just you know a climate and or a weather anomaly it's within the natural range and it is within the natural range of sure, variation yeah. it is however we have to survive this. Are there ways, are there techniques that we can employ that will allow us to survive this? And let everybody argue about all the theoretics that they want. You have to survive this. You have to find food. Yep. You have to find water. You have to find shelter from either the too hot or the too cold. And that's no joke. It's it's not, yeah. And it's, it's something I think that people... Um, assume that it's a problem that will be figured out for them, you know, that it's something that we don't necessarily have to uh, take uh, personal ownership of. I think sometimes people think it's just too big of a problem to begin to wrestle with. All right. Well, um, to tackle the whole problem actually probably is. And so yeah. that's why I start, and you know, I know we've rambled off the original question, but that's cool. No, yeah, right. no, that's great. <laughs> um, is I start with uh, how 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 is it that I'm driving down the road? We've had three days in a row of 116 degree weather. There hasn't been rain in like four months or whatever it is. Why is that stuff over in the ditch on the side of the road? Why is it growing? Yes. Well, yes. then invasive species. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> why yeah. why are they able to come in? and colonize the site, reproduce and spread, what magic are they doing? Uh, and, and you on the, on the West Coast, I don't even know you're old enough, but I was a junior in high school when Mount St. Helens blew up. Mm. And, and the scientists were saying it would be, oh, 40, 50 years before anything grows there again. Well, within three or four years, there's grasses and flowers all over the place. And then today, it's a fully functioning, healthy, uh, ecology for you know for the time being. How do you go from a volcanic wasteland to a complete perennial yep. ecosystem in 40 years? That's a miracle. That is super amazing earth magic. There, in in that kind of example, are, lie all of the secrets that we need to know as human beings when we encounter an environment that's hot as hell, has just been sterilized and obliterated by whatever it is, how did nature come back? Well, let's, let's help it out. Let's help it out. Let's collect a little bit more water. Let's spread it out. Let's you know, create some kind of shelter from the elements, whether it's hot, cold, you know, wet, dry, et cetera, and help these little biological islands to expand and to grow and learn how to utilize the natural plant communities that will survive in our place with the conditions that they are uh, with the disturbance regimes the way they are. Let's take Paradise, California a couple of years ago. These big, huge fires go through. Oh, it's a disaster. Well, if you go and look at uh, tree rings in these ancient redwood trees that go back 5,000 years, you'll see that every so often these fires come through. Not just little ground fires, but massive conflagrations. Mm -hmm. Oof, and they incinerate the place. It's a fairly regular cycle. California 
and Oregon for that matter, Southern Oregon and Eastern Oregon is a fire ecology period. Get over it. What on earth are human beings doing building combustible homes <laughs> in a fire ecology? We build out of stone, you build out of tile, you build underground. Well, and then why do we need to dig trenches all the way from the front range of the Colorado Rockies to bring water all the way around through the mountains, up and over the pumps and this and that and the other thing to send it down into the Los Angeles to the fucking Central Valley? I said, sorry, I said farming, didn't I? Into the Central Valley of California, yeah, where, where <laughs> almost two thirds of the produce in the USA is grown in this one valley, all yep. with irrigation water in a desert. And then it rains on Los Angeles. And what do you see? There's a disaster because all these concrete channels are letting all the rainwater flow away. The city is designed mm -hmm. to get rid of water. And you wonder why it's an extra desert on top of that. That is, that is totally bizarre. And if the fires go through and burn everything down, does it regenerate? No. But if you looked at aerial photographs from Paradise, California, all of the human stuff and the things that we put there was gone. But within the very next year, all the green came back. Why? Because yep. those plants know how to survive the soils the way they are, the rainfall regime the way they are, the fire, the wind, uh, you know, whatever the, 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 the ecological disturbances are. That's how we need to design our agriculture, the habitats where we live, and our own particular individual human lives. And if we don't do that, it's not a disaster. It's called stupidity, human stupidity. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and does that just result from a, you know, are we as humans just not being as observant as we should be? Like, is this just a lack of awareness issue that, or, or is it an arrogance issue that we just feel like we can settle wherever we want to? Well, it's both. You know, it's both. Yeah. Because, because we can. And, and so, oops, I almost kicked my computer down. But the, uh, as far as the, uh, if we think we can exist wherever we want to, human beings have existed in every habitat and climate on this planet except for Antarctica, because that's where that big uh, the the um, pyramid city with the geocentric space station and the lizard people that come down and control everybody. They have Antarctica. Right, that's right, their right. Place. But right. Yeah, got that's their else. space. Yeah. That's their place. <laughs> We've got everything else, um, and human beings have done it. You know, everywhere from the I mean, Barrow, Alaska, why would anyone have ever lived there in the first place? But they did. They had art. They had, you know, spirituality. They had music. They had love. They've experienced love and, and you know, all the human things. It has been rich human civilizations in all habitats on this planet. So we can live anywhere. Well, we don't have to make these these fragile things that uh, yes. get blown down in the wind, burned in a fire, washed away in a flood, are dependent on you know nuclear radioactive bombs that boil water to spin a turbine. We don't need that crap. We can live, human beings can live on this earth, perfectly happy, perfectly content, healthy, long lives, rich with all of the cultural values that we hold in high esteem, using no technology more extensive than a stick, and a stone. Yeah. And so, well, all right, now we got computers, these headphones. I can talk with you out, out in uh, Oregon. That's pretty cool. There are certain things that we can retain, and there are certain things mm -hmm. that we should just, you know, use for a while and figure out how to, to quietly put those away and kind of mm -hmm. learn the lesson and say, you know, boy, we learned something with that one, didn't we? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know. Let's not do and, that. Again. And <laughs> yeah, and it, it seems like we uh, we sometimes have a hard time putting down our toys, um, and and just uh, yeah, we 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 tend to cling to things really hard. And how did have you always kind of thought about these problems? Is that um, like how far back does wrestling with these issues go for you? Well, um, some of the like wake up calls, you know, as a, as a, as a human individual, as we grow up, there's certain things that all of a sudden strike you as like, whoa, something yeah. really changed in my world. And I was a, a little kid when, uh, uh, the whole Vietnam thing was going on and, mm -hmm. you know, and video cameras were first being invented. And so we got to see on live on television every night, like machine gun fights and people getting lit on fire and, you know, all this mm -hmm. carnage and destruction, some guy kneeling in the street, one that really struck me, guys kneeling in the street, and they're asking them all kinds of questions. And like, 
pistol whipping him as he stood there. And then after they finished asking him questions, they shoot him in the head. It's like, wow, the evening news, you know? Jeez, yeah. And, and so I started to question, like, what on earth is going on? Well, then not too many years later, I think it was 1974, I would have been like 12 years old or whatever. Um, the uh, oil exporting nations embargoed uh, crude oil coming mm -hmm. to the U.S. And uh, within weeks, you know, we went into fuel rationing. And, and uh, what they did is they'll look at the license plate of your car and the last digit of your license plate, if it was odd, you'd go on these days. If it was even, you go on those days. Then they cut you back to three days a week. And then they cut you down to two days a week, then one days a week, and then five gallons at a time. And we were in a... Um, during that time, my parents, all of a sudden, they downsized from the big old rumbling station wagon to a little Volkswagen Squareback. Uh, and then, uh, you know, my both my mom and my dad were former rural residents that got displaced by the Depression and World War II. So they grew up on farms and out in the woods, and they knew all about gardens and fishing and hunting and stuff like that. And, and that's how I got my love of the outdoors. Um, but they lived a suburban lifestyle, um, doing the whole nine to five thing. And so really quickly, you know, my parents started gardening in earnest. I think at one point in time, we had probably an acre and a half, two acres of gardens out in the backyard. Okay. And some, some of my heroes as a kid, uh, were like Helen and Scott Nearing, they're homesteaders of the day that, you know, they went off into the woods and they eked out a livelihood and they grew all their own food. It's like, but, they still traded for their rice and their beans and their apples and the walnuts, the bulk items, their carbohydrates, proteins, and oils, they still bought from farms. So we had the biggest gardens around and we still had to go to the store to get bread and meat. You know, what my dad went from, yeah. you know, we went from being an omnivorous family to being a, uh, only a fish and poultry family to eventually for a period of time, vegetarian. Um, so, you know, we were doing everything that was supposedly the best way to go. And being the oldest, I'm going to be the most responsible. You can imagine a 12 year old, like a 10 year old. And then my little baby brother was only like two. He's in the front seat in a car seat and um, it's hot as hell. We're in a gas line, like a half a mile gas line and the car runs out of gas. So the two big boys, me being 12, you know, <laughs> we have to get out and push. <laughs> And any of the people in your audience who are the oldest sibling knows that the next one down never pulled their weight. So who's pushing the car? <laughs> it's me. And if you're 12 years old and it's, you know, 90 degrees or whatever, and you're being, you know, told, commanded to push the car, you're going to get the wrath of mom. And I know as long as I'm pushing the car, she's going to be slapping my brother and not me. I'm good. Yep. I push it. I had a lot of time. <laughs> I had a lot of time to think about how dependent we were on fossil fuels and how dependent yeah. we were on this critically fragile system of how we got our food. We had to have fossil fuels in the car so my dad could go to work to get the money, to be able to drive to go get the food from a store where the food came in trucks from big, huge farms in California. Then we had to take it home and put it in our own little machine that kept it cool or kept it warm or heated it, cooked it. We were totally plugged into all these different things that without, with, with one little slip up in one of those little critical chains, we're toast. And even though we have the biggest garden in the world. And so yeah. here, another time to think a lot is when I'm out in the garden, because once again, I'm a 12 year old, I'm responsible, is um, I've got to pull weeds. And you know, you plant this garden. First of oh, all, there's all this cool stuff that was growing there. You have to rip it all up, flip it upside down. You make compost and it was a hell of a lot of work. And you get yep. really dirty, you're hot and sweaty. Um, to get carrots, I don't even like carrots in my soup. I'm sorry. I don't want. I want boiled carrots. I want something really good to eat. And so after I do my allotted um, penance or whatever it was, my uh, my sentence, I could go run around in the woods, and I go run around in the woods and collect hickory nuts and mushrooms and blueberries and raspberries and strawberries and grapes. It's like, wait a minute, I'm eating better just running around in the woods, having a great time. Um, yep. Then I am working my ass off in the garden, and it was somewhere in my you know early middle teenage years, and I don't know how it happened. I ran into the book Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith, written in uh, 1926, and he was he uh, was an advocate of uh, taking any hilly ground at all and no annual crops where we have to plow it 
uh, or use herbicide, any of that kind of stuff. On the, on the hillier ground, grow grass underneath and grow trees up top that produce seeds, fruit, nuts, berries, et cetera. Because in his day, about 50% of all annual crops went to feed livestock. It's a little bit more than that now. Um, why not let feed the, feed the livestock tree seeds and nuts and berries? A pig doesn't care if it's eating an acorn or, or <laughs> corn. Yeah. Maybe it does. I don't know. But, you know, it, it leads acorns. It still eats them. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my pigs are out, you know, running around in a designed system. It's not like turn them loose in the woods. That, those days are over. We, we now have to design systems that are ecologically hyperactive, that have green from all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, so we can have as much photosynthesis as possible, producing all the different things that we need in order to, um, you know, to, uh, to feed us and to feed all these animals as well. I'm going to show, I just, I'm, <laughs> I'm at my dad's house. He's 90 years old. Um, we've had to put him into supervised care recently. So for the past month, I'm just cleaning it out, throwing stuff out. And I find all kinds of stuff. And if you can see this well at all, it's a little glare. There we go, right there. Wow. That's, yeah, we can see it. That's a picture of New Forest Farm in 1996. Wow. Uh, 1996. Uh, 1995, <clears throat> that was um, like overgrown corn stubble. <clears throat> and so that's where New Forest Farm started was an abandoned crop field. It was abandoned because it had been, you know, just eroded like you wouldn't believe, huge two foot wide, three feet deep gullies going down all through it and exposed yeah. all the bedrock and they just forget it. The yields are too oh, low. God. We're yeah. not going to make payments anymore. And they walked away from it. So that's what we started with. And then by following the example of the plants in the ditches on the side of the road, we planted plant community types of the species that are adapted to the, the soil, the weather, the climate regime, the disturbance regimes, lightning, hail, um, all that kind of stuff. And you let that system go through natural succession and you steer it along the way. And how you steer it is by managing it and you manage it by harvesting it. We would harvest the fruits, nuts, and the berries ourselves. We would grow annual crops, vegetables in the rows in between all of the trees. And we would have the animals do the weed control, eating all the grasses, keeping them away from the trees that also conveniently fertilize the trees with manure and urine at the same time. Yep. Um, so we were <clears throat> all of a sudden, we were creating a savanna ecology um, from a desert ecology that was there was, you know, virtually nothing living there. It had been herbicided and plowed to death. And, and what's amazing about the savanna uh, ecotype is that the savanna is the, is the biome that that supports the most mammal life of any biome on the planet, and a, and technically a savanna is a a grassy area with between um, thirty and sixty percent uh, woody plant cover, so it can be a shrubland with grass, it can be a um, thin forest with grass, it can be widely spaced trees with grass and drier areas when it can't support as many trees but it's a combination of both trees and grass. And that was what J. Russell Smith was recommending. Let's take all the benefits of the forest and kind of pull yeah. it out here into the agriculture. And let's take all the benefits of agriculture and bring it here onto the forest and have this <laughs> different system. It's neither agriculture nor forestry in the strict sense of the word. It's a, it's a combination with its own emergent properties. And I've rambled again, geez. You didn't even well, no, no, and that's you've, you've, <laughs> well, no, it's great because you've touched on so many topics that I look forward to spinning out, and I like nonlinear conversations, so this is uh, totally fine with me. And I'm glad you brought up the savanna thing because I think this is something um, that is also underappreciated. So, in some of my work, just as a educator um, out here in Oregon, you know, we have um, oak, savanna, oak savanna habitats and and some other things. And one thing that I teach about is that savannas are some of the most biodiverse um, ecosystems that you'll ever be in. And people are always kind of astounded by that. And like, what do you mean? It doesn't seem like there's much here. And it's like, well, you have to, you have to kind of stop, think, and watch and listen. Um, because as you start to use your senses, think about how many birds you hear that, you know, like how many different bird songs you hear. Think about how many different plant species are actually here. What's actually in that grass? There's actually tons of biodiversity in the grass, just in the grass itself. Um, and then not to mention the uh, 
fauna that comes with that all of the insects and the and uh, i already mentioned the birds and and then the webs of life start to expand it's not not as biodiverse as a tropical rainforest but i mean that's a that's an amazing exception and, right. and actually the, the one of the keys to the biodiversity is water you know having water enough water in liquid form for a long enough period of time is is one of the critical factors to biodiversity yeah absolutely yeah and we, gosh we're starting to see that the uh the lack of water that we're having here in Oregon right now, I, I assume that's what this is. I don't know, but the pest pressure in my garden this year has been enormous. And I don't know if it's because pests are trying to find water. And so they're uh, chewing up more things in the garden to, to get to that. I don't know. Um, but also it's... there's just fewer things. There's fewer things thriving. Sure. So all, how the, all the pests emerge in the spring. And if there's, you know, if there's a baseline level of 100 tons per, you know, square mile yep, of yep. insect food that they eat, all of a sudden it's only producing 75 tons of insect food. They're going to go everywhere they can, and there will be more pressure in your gardens. I have the same issue with uh, predators and livestock. Mm -hmm. um, during a drought season, um, predators on, on chickens and guinea fowl are mm -hmm. just insane. It's just amazing because they, they start running out of stuff to eat. I also have noticed that during a drought uh, season is that many of the birds will just go away. Yeah. And just take off. And this, this spring, this June, we had the hottest, uh, driest spell. It was June, I think it was 16th before we had any rain. We hadn't had any rain since last fall. And then we had like uh, 11 days in a row of over 90 degrees, which was totally insane. And then fortunately we got slammed with a three inch rain followed a week later by a three inch rain just yesterday two towns south of me is underwater because you know that much rain fell all at once and there wasn't enough vegetation to soak yeah. it up because the corn's only this tall so um now i've got the rain captured it in the landscape soaked it in um i think we'll be all right for the rest of the season but all my birds not all my birds a huge proportion of my birds already bailed out usually four o'clock in the wow. morning may and june man you can't sleep anymore it doesn't matter you, you can't sleep they're just birds are crazy and then this year it was noticeably less because they there was nothing to eat they went somewhere else yeah well and that's fascinating too those patterns that you pick up on um when you're paying attention to all of those aspects of of your landscape um because that's that's another thing i wouldn't have really thought of but that makes perfect sense and some of the concerns that I have that go with those patterns, it's like because I have all of these birds around, have created this amazing habitat. It's a it's a magnet for every, it's everything under the sun. And so if I have, let's say I have, you know, 100,000 birds of various different species, um, what happens if I have a bad year here and they don't reproduce? Right. Like, oh, my gosh, this becomes a critically important habitat island for those birds. Well, then if they go away, well, where are they going? What's happening when they go to South America, Central America? What happens if they go further north? You know, are my birds yeah. going to be alive? So every one of us, no matter how big the, the piece of ground is that you live on, we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters, our feathers and the mm -hmm. scales and the, and the slippery skins people, is we've got to make sure that they've got habitat too. Yep, absolutely. And it's it's not enough to expect that, you know, oh, Audubon Society or whatever organizations out there that have, you know, um, parks and land set aside, that those little sanctuaries are going to be enough. Uh, it's something that right in line with what you're describing is, you know, habitat corridors, people um, providing enough habitat in their landscapes and gardens and things so that there's a, enough of a system of ecosystems that these animals can move around and if you get them on an island well, and, and, right they're gonna they're gonna peter out and disappear so you know kind of whole uh uh biogeography and island biogeography and stuff like that and population of species with islands and stuff like that well now you connect these habitat islands with corridors like yep. screw that i'm into habitat everywhere yes okay? yeah. everywhere yeah. Everywhere on this planet can support greenery, which can support life, you know, higher orders of life, insect and amphibians and reptiles and mammals and yeah. birds. So let's have an everywhere habitat. None of this islands crap and none of this 
corridors everywhere. Yeah. Then let's figure out how to manage. What, what would it be like? What would it be like for human beings to manage a fully functional, just green, amazingly green humming sphere going through space? The biology is, right. is popping so fast. How do we deal with it all? That's the problem I want humanity to see. That's a, yeah. And that's a beautiful vision. It is, especially thinking about it in that grander context of, you know, we're on this rock in space and steward, you know, playing this part of stewards to um, see these, you know, these natural cycles, these ecosystems, all, you know, this grand organism, you know, um, right. thriving. It's, it's a really majestic and, and amazing thing to think about in that context. But, and this segues to something I wanted to make sure to talk about. So, some people listening, maybe they don't know what the problems of modern conventional agriculture are. So can you speak a little bit like what are we doing wrong right now? Um, just in terms of agriculture, it's, we've been talking really broadly, but, um, you know, to, to folks that, you know, all of these concepts are a little new. Uh, what exactly is going wrong that we even need to address um, and when it comes to how we farm well, and that sort of thing? <clears throat> What I'm going to do is I'm going to avoid uh, the term wrong, okay? Yeah. And one of the reasons why I'm going to avoid this comes from some of my uh, ancestral background, some of the, the creation myths from, from my family line, is that the biggest mistake that human beings made, the first one, was to separate things into distinct categories. This is good. This is evil. Yeah. And that is the beginning of a problem right there. So everything is what we do has an effect. Yes. What have we done? What is the effect? Are we uh, okay with living with that effect? How can we mitigate the problems that we've caused by this effect? So let's plan. Let's take action. Let's seek feedback from what we did and let's adjust to make sure that we're working towards this common goal, which in my tradition is to take care of this garden. That's the first order. That's why we're here in the first place is to take care of this garden. So, all right. Um, what is it about agriculture, uh, the way it's currently practiced right now? The majority of the staple food crops that humans eat, and by staple foods, I mean the carbohydrates, proteins, and oils. Uh, this is not like the kale. This is not the lettuce. It's not the carrot. This is like the rice, the beans. The wheat, you know, which becomes your bread, your pasta, yeah. it's the meat, it's the fish. Those are your staple foods. Um, most of humanity's staple foods come from annual plants. You grow the plant for a short season, three to five months. It sets a lot of seeds. You either save those seeds and eat them directly. You feed those seeds to other animals and eat the animals or eat the animals' products. Or you use the seeds for making industrial products, sugars and plastics and blah, 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 blah. So that is the, the majority of our agriculture are annual crops. Well, an annual crop, in order for it to grow, it needs to have a disturbance in the ecological system of the planet. If a tree blows over, it leaves a little pit in the mound where its roots were. It's got exposed soil. Mount St. Helens blew up. What came in first? These windblown uh, seeds and these hard annual plants, they put a root down, they grow real fast because they may not have enough nutrients, they may not have enough water to survive long. Some of them only, only grow for like a few weeks and they set seed and they're done. But what they've done is they put a little carbon in the soil, they made a little bit of a mulch layer. And through the long history of time, how fast that period or that process takes place is limited by too much hot, too much cold, too much wet, too much dry. Um, eventually, the earth clothes, clothes itself in greenery, and that the, the forms of, that the greenery take go from patchy desert-type landscape that we can see in our minds to a grassland, to grasslands punctuated by shrubs, to grasslands punctuated by shrubs and a few trees here and there. And at that point in time, what you end up with is a lot of combustible materials. So we have a lot of uh, fire that now becomes part of the disturbance regime. And eventually what happens if there's enough moisture, the canopy of the trees can close. There's not enough light reaching the forest floor. All the grasses disappear. And then you have an old growth, um, uh, late successional forest. That's the process that we can follow 
with food all along the way. What annual agriculture does is it disturbs the soil. It makes a Mount St. Helens volcano, and it never has a chance to recover to a full, complete ecosystem again. Uh, it either you know plows it or herbicides it year after year after year after year. There's there's places in China that have been farmed uh, for four thousand years. Um, the Lus Plateau is is one of the examples of a place that's been farmed for four thousand years, and all of the nutrition, uh, all of the topsoil has blown away, eroded with with um, the rain because now that you don't have all these plant roots holding the soil in place, now that you don't have canopies of leaves preventing the rain from driving down on it. You pound uh, the, the, the soil, it turns into a muddy slush, and then you're washing your soil away. Anywhere that human beings have practiced annual agriculture, the nature of annual agriculture is you have to destroy a perennial ecosystem first. Now you got dirt, now you plant your crops. And then you keep fighting against the, the when succession tries to come back, all the weeds in your garden, that's nature trying to cover everything with green and you can't win. Nobody's been able to beat that yet. Even the big ag farmers are. So by now what's happened is it, it's, it's pushing 50% of the planet is, is destroyed ecosystems that are only there to hold our little hard seeds, our wheat and our corn and our beans and our lentils and our chickpeas and so on and so on. And look at the cradle of civilization. Why do you think people built civilizations in the middle of a desert? They didn't. Yeah. They built they built cities where there were confluences of rivers because there's your transportation, your communication. You had to have big forests nearby, so you'd have building materials for beams on houses, for ships, for you know, for chariots and spears and bows and arrows. And so what happened is annual crops civilization destroyed the ecosystem. It washed away the nutrition in the food became less and less and less. People got hungry. Now we had to protect the food. There becomes the rich class, the poor class is the permanent standing military. And now it's like, hey, we're running out of stuff. Let's go get those guys because they got some stuff. And so the whole conquest you know, follows from that. So the whole annual crops civilization, I think the root of the problem is our reliance on annual crops as our staple foods instead of healthy intact ecosystems as a way to supply a diversity of staple foods, which would be different from place to place, different throughout the seasons of the year, and um, not too different than the way we eat now, except you're not going to have as, as many noodles and as much bread. Yeah, which we could, uh, health-wise, we could probably all uh, do without a little bit of. <laughs> right. And yeah, so that's why I don't eat it. Yeah, and and so what we're so to in this nonlinear fashion that we're doing here. So coming back around to you know you're a young guy recognizing that you know there's a lot going on, a lot of problems with kind of how we're living on the planet, all of these things. What actually led to purchasing uh, what became New Forest Farm? <laughs> about uh, about 12 years of figuring out how to play the real estate game. Yeah. I, I grew up in what were the equivalent of, of the projects. And, you know, believe it or not, actually working class whites actually lived in government built housing and shit like that. And there's, you know, gangs and knifings and stuff like that. Um, you know, a couple of my childhood buddies were, you know, killed in drug deals and stuff like that gang wars and blah, blah. It's like, I don't want to live this way. I'm not going to live this way. How do I get the hell out of here? Well, how you get the hell out of here is you get to go to a good school, get a good job, a good education. And it's like, you know, we're on food stamps. What's, what are my chances of getting one of those two scholarships to get the hell out of here? Yeah. Well, then I'm looking around and I'm, I'm checking out a lot of these get rich quick kind of back then it was like, um, uh, it was infomercials like on channel 27, you know, on Saturday afternoon, these people talking about, oh yeah, you can do this and this and this. And so I, I went to a whole bunch of different get rich quick seminars on how to buy real estate with no money down. And it was, uh, I was probably 21 or tw yes, 21. Um, my third attempt at college, um, 
<laughs> my third attempt at college, and it was actually my favorite time because uh, I was studying ecology, studying oh, nice. you know how yeah. nature works. It was uh, it was like two or three o'clock in the morning. We were probably you know um, practicing you know herbal remedies and stuff like that. And this guy comes on the television. He's he's a guy who moved his hands like this when he's talking about how he used his credit cards to buy real estate. It's like that sounds like a really cool idea. So I started, um, I, I bought his program, which was way too much money. I couldn't afford it, but it had a 30 day money back guarantee. There you go. And so put it on my credit card, had it for 30 days, sent it back, refunds, you know, back to the credit card. And I started playing the program. And what you do is you begin by building your credit, mm -hmm. you know, don't get rid of your credit cards, get more credit cards and actively use those credit cards to pay your bills. However, what you do first is you pay that credit card off. If I've got, if I got to pay, if I got to buy groceries, for example, right, and I have cash because I have a job or whatever it is that I got my cash for, instead of spending the cash on the groceries, I'll buy the groceries on my credit card. Well, then back then it was like 29 days. If you paid the credit card before 29 days went by, there was no interest generated. Now it's like 14 yeah. days. And so then all I do is I then pay back the credit card ahead of time. But instead of using my cash, I'd use my cash to put into an investment that I can't use, which at the time all I had you know, when I'm 21 was U.S. Schedule E savings bonds that you can't touch them for five mm -hmm. years. Yeah, yeah. So I'd put them into U.S. Schedule E savings bonds, only getting 3% interest. But what I was doing is I was using interest-free money, paying it off with other interest-free money. Uh, in order to build my credit rating until all of a sudden I had the ability to borrow money and I bought a clear cut up in Maine. Oh. Who wants to buy a clear cut, right? It's ugly. It's horrible. It's whatever. Yep. Well, I do because I'm going to replant this into a food paradise. This was before the book permaculture was written. This was, you know, before the internet or anything, I just had to figure this stuff out on my own. And what I figured out really early, is like, well, gee, if I got, if I got, uh, 80 acres of land that I'm paying for on a credit card. You paid a credit card with a credit card. You paid a credit card with a credit card. No biggie. Um, if if it costs me uh, you know this much money for trees, and I put that on 80 acres, that's going to be 25 grand. How am I going to come up with the money to buy all those trees? Well, if um, if I buy 100 trees, it costs me like 10 bucks a tree. If I buy 500 mm -hmm. trees, it costs me five bucks a tree. Hmm, I see a program here. But if I buy a thousand trees, it only costs me 250 a tree. All I got to do is sell, somebody do the math on that for me. Right. All I got to do is like sell 350 trees. I get my original 100 and damn, I've got like 500 trees left over, you know, 400 trees left over. What do I do with them? Put them in on the land. You salvage the materials. You know, the, the logs and the sticks and the brush, you, mm -hmm. you know, salvage a couple of pieces of scrap plywood. You build a recreational cabin. You have an appraiser come in. You pay for the appraisal on the property. The appraisal is worth this much money. So then you borrow up to what the bank will allow you to do it, and you put it onto the next property. You buy it again. Yep. And you just keep rolling the debt forward. Have you ever heard, like, uh, every fall, how the U.S. government, oh, kicking the can down the road. Right. That's how the economy works, man. That's how it works. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and, and uh, uh, Donald Trump has gone bankrupt, I think, like five or six, seven times mm -hmm. in his adult life. So every seven years it's programmatic. But what he's doing is he's buying all these properties that he sets up as a different separate individual entity mm -hmm. that each of those entities has their own legal rights as an individual. And as long as they're cash flowing, everything's good. Well, if they can't cash flow, he pays some of the bills with his own personal borrowing. And when he borrows up to his limit, and he can't pay anymore. It's all like credit card right. debt. It's unsecured. It's not attached to the property. He goes bankrupt. And they can't touch the property. That's brilliant. Fascinating. It may be, may be evil. He can do it with, with, with condos and skyscrapers and, and, and casinos. I've, I'm doing it. I've been doing it for 35 years now with, with degraded agricultural and natural resources property. Wow. So over over 325 acres of, of clear cuts up in Maine that have been rehabbed, two different parcels up in Alaska, bought a third one in Alaska that I flipped because I needed the cash to get this place down here. Um, and then there was another one right down the road from me here in Wisconsin that I bought and I flipped, sold to a friend, that kind of thing. And I'm involved in a whole bunch of other projects all around the country and all around the world. So for, for 35 years, I've not had a job. 
I've, I've been a non-selling flipper. Nice. And it's been 100%, 100% debt financed. Wow. And the reason why I wanted to do that, one reason why I want to do that, because I want to hang out in the woods. Yep. I want to hang out, <laughs> talk to the chickadees and put my feet in the brook. And I want to make this world a better place. And, and I know that what I've done with the biology on planet Earth here, it's going to take bulldozers and chainsaws mm-hmm. uh, to undo the actual ecological good that I've done on this planet. Yeah. And it produces food, produces food. I don't buy food. Wow. And, I don't buy food. and is that largely because like you were saying, just rethinking where you're getting your, your primary dietary inputs from and finding those alternatives to uh, things like wheat and corn. And well, so that, now you're talking alternatives. That's the same thing as good and evil. Okay. It's like, here is a place. What is this place? What's the soils like? What are the plants that are here? What's the rainfall? What's the ecological systems here? Let's make this system hyperactive and utilize it. And remember I said before that everywhere except Antarctica where the lizard men live, (laughs) um, human beings have lived. So how did they live there? What's there? Instead of, oh, let's go foraging. I just saw a post on Facebook today. Oh, yeah, whenever I go foraging for something, I find something else. It's like, well, this whole entire planet is one gigantic garden. Everything is, almost everything is edible or it's medicinal, it's useful in some way. So no matter where you go, this is my diet. Yeah. yeah. What time of year is it? This is my diet. Yep. And human beings have evolved, adapted, created, however we got here. We've been this way for zillions of years. We are capable of living within our environment, no matter where we are, um, and being healthy. Yeah. It, it kind of works. It's just a matter of dialing in your your perspective or the way that you're going about things to try to figure out what's the most uh, uh, is the, the the realistic way to like actually live wherever you're living with the resources that are available in that space and in, and in time and if you are. And if you really if you really want to push that exercise, do it with only a stick and a stone as your technology. Because you think about it, the computer and the microphones and the internet that we're talking on today started with a stick and a stone. And you use these tools to make the next tool, to make the next tool, to make the next tool. And if we have to go back to the stick and the stone, if we don't have the ecology there to support us, we're toast. And if you look at many places, and I've gone to many places around the world, that's about all they have left. Yeah. There's a stick and a stone and a broken a broken bottle actually is an amazing tool, <laughs> an incredible tool. That's... And and plastic, scrap scrap plastic. I I watched this twelve year old kid um, in Haiti make a slingshot out of three used condoms. Wow. And he shot two birds and brought it wow. and he brought it home to mom to eat. Wow. You know, so yeah. that's that's being resourceful. Yep. Absolutely resourceful. Absolutely, yeah. Man, that's that's really cool. What what are some of the, um, I guess, you know, as you have set off on this journey and have, um, you know, been experimenting to try to kind of figure out how to make all this work, what have been some of the, uh, I guess, biggest challenges that you've run into um, in scaling, you know, uh, you know, these these principles out at scale? Well, actually, one of my biggest challenges is that because uh, this way to look at Mm. the uh, living systems of our planet is so different than what you're taught and told and programmed that people don't believe it. Yeah. And then for one, they don't believe it. Well, then two, they're afraid. Mm -hmm. They're really, really, really afraid because – you don't know how to live any other way than the way you live right now. And if things get really bad, if, if, if they go Haiti on us in, in Oregon, if they go, you know, any kind of social collapse happens, even for a show, look what the hell yeah. happened when COVID yeah, happened. Yeah. What was this fascination with, with toilet paper? That's the first <laughs> thing you run to? Oh, my gosh, this is nuts. And, th- and then that sets up all these cascading chain of, of shortages. Yeah. That is just, it was bizarre. It's like, well, it kind of happened. And, oh, gee, I stayed home for several months and had a blast. I got a lot of work done around the farm. It was great. Um, you know, so, so uh, people, 
for one, they don't believe that this is real. And two, they don't do it because they're afraid. They're absolutely afraid. Yeah, well, and even, you know, like we went through this shakeup last year and people got a what I thought was a pretty strong wake up call to the fragility of our supply chains and just how easy it is, you know, for things to really start to uh, start to break down and cause problems. But then here we are. It seems like most people have like forgotten or have just moved on. Uh, uh, we don't talk about the toilet paper shortages of 2020 anymore. Right. You know, we just just kind of like going back to business as usual. Um, and I know that's not the case for everybody. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that last year was um, a, a significant enough shakeup that, you know, it may take time, but there are changes at work in people's minds thinking about their dependencies on things. But um, what was the temperature? What was the temperature there today? I, I think it hit 112 or 110 or something today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cool beans, Oregon, right. 113, 112. Yeah, everything's, <laughs> everything's fine. fine. Back to just turn the AC up. Yeah, just, ah. yeah everything's good. You can now uh, go to your restaurants and congregate again. Just keep moving forward. Shit, you're in, you're in Oregon. You can go to the restaurants tripping on mushrooms. You're right. And congregate again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's normal, man. It's fine. We can't feel a thing. It's fine. <laughs> just don't uh, just don't pay too much attention of the grander uh, uh, things. Right. Going on here, but um, well, go. You know, actually, one of the things is go to the study the collapses of. Yeah, civilizations. Yeah, yeah. You know, the collapses of Rome and the Phoenicians yep. and the Greeks and the, on and on and on and on and on and see what happens at the end times. There's this massive separation between the well, ultra wealthy, the ultra poor. Then they, the ultra wealthy now have to protect themselves against the ultra poor. So they now have make gated yep. communities. Can you say castles? And then right. have to have a standing military to keep the poor people out. And uh, they, they, but they both missed the point is they've destroyed the resource base that allowed this abundance in the first place. So what we need to do is we now need to recreate the resource base that can support an abundance and live in abundance within a recreated abundant ecological system. That's what I work toward. And it's possible. It's real. You don't have to believe it. I don't care. And if I'm not going to try to convince somebody who doesn't want to believe this, grab a shovel, start planting some trees in the right places. Yeah. Uh, and away we go. We need all boots on the ground. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and like I said at the beginning, that's the reason I wanted to talk to you because um, there are lots of people out there that talk about regenerative agriculture and permaculture and stuff, but very few that have actually applied it uh, for any extended length of time, especially out here in Oregon. I've run into plenty of people that have been permaculture designers for like a couple of years until it gets hard and then they do something else <laughs> and uh, you right. know and so like that's a an important piece is that um it is possible it has been done and it just requires um uh, i think a, a certain pragmatism and, and perspective and of course dedication but this this actually highlights something i wanted to make sure to ask you which is do you think there are certain common misconceptions about permaculture that um when people first get into studying this and, and this is relates to i wanted to ask you about your uh studying with bill mollison and stuff too but um especially like i said i mean i'm i'm a mississippi boy that moved out to oregon um and so it's been fascinating to me i got into permaculture while i was in mississippi studying these things and then uh moved to oregon for grad school studying biology and education and things. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to be in this community of people that are already like so far ahead of me studying all these things. I can't wait. I interned at some permaculture farms and I learned really quickly that like the permaculture community itself is very um, like all over the place. And it's hard to find the people that are like yourself that are actually trying to like really implement these concepts at scale in a meaningful way and showing people, you know, the practical steps forward. Um, so I guess that's just one thing I wanted to pick your brain about. What are your thoughts about just kind of how the, the permaculture uh, kind of movement has grown? And, and do you, do you see some of the same things that I've seen that uh, sometimes people jump into it and kind of have some, 
um, misconceptions about it or, or think that it's, uh, some people think it's really easy. Uh, some people think that it's kind of a thing where you just don't really do anything to land and just let it go and, and do its thing. So I, I don't know, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, well, some of my thoughts, what I'm going to do, I, I, you know, I obviously see that, you know, the permaculture movements all over the yeah. map everywhere. Um, uh, I like to go back to the beginning, way back in the beginning. And let's remember, okay, the word permaculture yeah. is a contraction of two words. Yeah. It's original definition, permanent agriculture. Well, what is agriculture? Agriculture means the production of food, fuels, medicines, and fibers for human culture, which is where this permanent, permanent culture yeah. idea comes from. Oh, but I'm a social permaculturist. It's like, what do you eat? <laughs> and what I want every permaculturist who's listening to this right now, if you're into permaculture at all, stop eating food that was not grown in permaculture systems today. Yeah. And if you can't do that, you're not doing permaculture well enough. Because if you can't produce your own food, fuels, medicines, and fibers, and then have enough of a surplus to either share, give away, mm -hmm. or sell it at an exorbitant usury ripoff prices, if you haven't created a surplus beyond your needs, you've missed the whole point. And what we are is we are individual point sources. We are the designers. We're using uh, back to Bill Mollison. Yeah. And much of our designs come from NYCHA. <laughs> so you look at nature, imitate nature. Yep. No yep. joke. We don't have to come up with guilds. Nature's figured out what guilds work in Oregon, California, New Mexico. Nature knows how to rule, knows how to roll with this mess, you know? So imitate that. And then now figure out how to sustain yourself and your family and your friends and your community from those ecological systems, now we generate a surplus that we can then use to, you know, trade with others for things that we don't have. We now have the basis of an actual economy mm -hmm. that comes from the ecology. And so, and I think permaculturists, uh, the, the whole permaculture framework to me was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. It gave, it gave a design framework and a protocol to things that it were all kind of like just stirring around in me. All of a sudden it's like, aha, we can now systematize our approach to living on this planet and create more abundant ecosystems than were possible by random chance. Um, so the oak savanna of the Midwest or the pine forests of, of you know, Northeast Maine, et cetera, they had a certain amount of productivity that was natural. Well, when you go in there and using the understanding that we have, a scientific understanding, we actually can increase the total productivity of those sites. One of the ways that we increase the total productivity is by harvesting. So by harvesting in the right way, and how do you know the right way? You have to study the ecosystems you're talking about. Study the life cycles of the plants you're talking about. Study the life cycles of the animals that you're talking about. And learn how to insert yourself into those life cycles and manage it so it all stays humming. You know, you, you put your car up at whatever, 3,500 RPM, whatever the sweet spot is when you can just, you know, go 170 <laughs> and hardly use any fuel or whatever it is. You want to find where that sweet spot is that uses the sunlight, the air, the water, and the minerals from the soil, and boom, it is now yeah. optimized. We have the intellectual ability as human beings to learn from nature how to optimize the ecological systems of any place on the planet. And then if we've optimized that system, we can now insert ourselves into the process of optimization and harvest the actual genuine ecological annual surplus and an easy number easy number for someone in natural resources if you're planting uh white pine in the northeast for example like new york up through yeah. up through massachusetts and maine um if you take a field and you plant white pines here's how much it costs you to put them in you let them grow through time their their mean annual gain is about seven percent mm. what it's like yeah this year you know, 7% of an ounce is not much. 7% of two ounces is a little bit more. Three pounds, five pounds, 7% of this 35 ton, 12 foot diameter white pine is a massive amount. Yeah. So that's the basis of a real economy is the sun goes up, sun goes down, rain falls from the sky, 
plants grow, we have hot seasons, we have cool seasons. That's the basis of our economy. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was that was really well put. And it's something that, that you just mentioned that I think is what I honed into when I moved out here that kind of disappointed me a little bit. As you said, you know, the whole point is to get to that point of surplus so that then you're you're sharing and you're establishing that economy. And I remember right before I moved to Oregon, I was um I was volunteering at a hummingbird festival um in Mississippi for right before we left and I was talking to um oh, who was it? Oh, Doug Tallamy. I don't know if you are familiar with him. Uh he wrote a book called uh, Bringing Bringing Nature Home. Um Oh, I've I've heard the title. Yeah. yeah. A great yeah. book. Um and I was excited to talk to him because he you know, he talks about understanding, you know, what species support, you know, greater levels of biodiversity, and it, it ties into understanding, um, you know, your ecosystems and everything. But I mentioned, I was like, yeah, I'm excited about permaculture, because I see that as, you know, being something really big that could, you know, help on all sorts of levels. And he's like, well, and he got kind of uh, uh, this look on his face. He's like, most permaculturists only seem to care about themselves. And at the time, I was, I was like, ooh, okay. Um, but then I moved out here, and I realized what he meant, which is that a lot of people get into permaculture because they're worried about themselves and their survival, you know, and everything like that. And sometimes they're, a lot of times, their implementations of these ideas really stop at just like, am I, am I okay? And not like, is my community okay? Are my like wild neighbors, the wildlife and everything, are they okay? Just more of like, am I able to get through the apocalypse? You know, is sort of the uh, um, the perspective. And I started to understand that subtle difference. It disappointed me at the time when he said that, but now I think I have a better understanding of kind of what he was getting at because um, he's probably you know just talked to a lot of people and and kind of seen that. But I, I just wanted to highlight that because that is an important part that per permaculture, permanent agriculture, permanent culture, it it implies the stewardship not just for the ecosystems but also our, our communities and and recognizing our interconnectedness between you know our our families and the other humans that we um share the space with too um and being able to support each other um and i i'm not going to keep you i know we're we're running long on time please let me know if you have to run otherwise i'll just keep rambling um <laughs> but I did want to ask you what I won't I won't be much different. Yeah. <laughs> well good. Uh, two peas in a pod then. Uh I definitely wanted to ask you what your experience was like um studying permaculture and and learning from Bill Mollison. I mean that's a very uh special thing to to be able to do. I was able to learn under uh a, a two degree separation. So someone who studied under Bill Mollison is is who I studied under, but um what well, what was that experience like? Well, it was it was um, it was just around when dial-up internet was just getting started, uh, and uh, there had been a whole bunch of turmoil and rifts in the in the U.S. permaculture community, and he had come over to restart the whole I thing, um, and so my my relationship with him was uh by telephone and correspondence people actually used to write handwritten <laughs> Can letters you and that? stuff like that and go back and forth yeah and um and i the, i remember this one conversation that we had uh one of the things that he really stressed that i like to stress as well is that permaculture is based on observation yeah. if you want to turn it into a hard science it can be turned into a hard science. It has to be reality-based, evidence-based. We have to create context-appropriate solutions, um, and they have to be real solutions. Uh, what, what was causing some of the rifts is people with different, um, we'll call them philosophical backgrounds mm -hmm. or cultural backgrounds, were coming in and teaching their narrative, oh, but this is really how you know the non-material world the spiritual world is and how it works in plants oh no no this one is the right one and, and it's like you can't do that once you leave the realm of the observable yeah and you go into the realm where you have to just believe something that's called a faith mm -hmm. um and you you can't have that in a coherent 
a body that's attempting to accomplish something the way the permaculture movement is. Just look at all of the different, you know, major world views right now of today. They're not getting along very well. They never have gotten along very well. And that one little place over across the Mediterranean there, they've been blowing themselves up for what, four or five thousand? I don't know yeah. how many thousands yeah. of years. They're not gonna they're not gonna agree. Get over it. So that's why we have to leave uh we have to leave the uh the the subjects that require you to believe something mm -hmm. out of the conversation with permaculture. You know, the permaculture is about how do you live here? How do you deal with capturing water? How do you deal with because you need air, you need water, you need food, these are some basic human needs. And no matter where you are, no matter what you believe, you may think that everything came from the original spaghetti monster swamp. And, you know, the whole spaghetti monster permeates the whole entire universe. And that's the one true way. And everything remembers the great spaghetti sauce flood and all that. That That's fine. This is how a tree grows. This is a tree from a, a lemon. In California, you can grow lemons. It needs this much water. This is how we get it to collect water from the, from the rainfall. This is how we get it to collect water, condense it from the atmosphere. That growing a lemon tree does not depend on what I believe. It depends on its own kind of thing. It is, it is separate from your worldview, his worldview, her worldview. We can all believe different things, and that's fine. But this is how a lemon tree grows. That's one of the, actually a problem. That's you'd asked earlier some of my challenges. Um, you know, people ask a question about this, that, and the other thing. Well, this is how this works. Well, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't enter into this for a discussion. This is how this works. Look, this is, you know, that's <laughs> how it works. And, and, you know, people that they just want to have their own, you know, this, yeah. Don't get me started. This one guy, this one guy wanted to grow peaches just really bad. It's like, oh, but I can microclimate. It's like, well, mm -hmm. cool. And actually, that is another one in California. We'll just microclimate, sure. And then what are we going to do about this? Well, then we'll do this. And pretty soon, you know, in his imagination, he's got this whole, you know, under plastic city for 95 miles and the heat and the nuclear power plants and all that stuff. Because guess what? You can't really grow peaches in Saskatchewan that well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna have to have to be involved in a breeding program. You have to have water yeah. capture going on. This is a long term play. It's a natural process. And then this other client was really into um, uh, AI and like these um, mm -hmm. enhanced experiences where yeah. you, you know you go into this place and it's just whatever. And they wanted to do an educational uh, experience where you go to this property and it's a, and it is literally now a restored jungle garden of Eden. And then you put the goggles on, you have all the educational information about all the different things as well. That's a really cool idea because you'll get all the tech people coming in. One problem, the place where you want to do this is not a place where you can have a tropical, uh, you know, right. rainforest garden of Eden. Well, yeah, we can, because it is like, <laughs> no, you can't because the soil's wrong, the temperature's wrong, mm -hmm. the, this mm -hmm. is wrong. You don't have the water. Da, 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 da. And, we'll, and then we'll do this. Well, but then that violates your first thing that you said you wanted it to be totally sustainable and ecological. If you want yeah. it to be sustainable and ecological, I'm working with some folks right now in in the, in the desert southwest. It's like, oh yeah, but you know, we want to just have a, a paradise that only. Uh, mm -hmm. exists on the rainwater that falls from the sky. It's like, well, okay, you get three inches of rain a year that falls from the sky. It's going to look very similar to what you see around here. It's going to be this scrubby pinion juniper. Juniper, yes, we concentrate water in little pockets. We can start to hydrate the landscape. It's a long-term play. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to get a Disney World Garden of Eden here in a short period of time yeah. sustainably. Yeah, get ready to eat a lot of bulb. Uh, <laughs> bulbs out of the ground that you're gonna dig up. I, like, that's uh, something I've I've learned studying the uh, you know the plants out here and how um, you know humans have been able to survive in some of the really um, you know intense uh, situations that we have out here. You know, this very desert like. It's like, well, you know, they focused on salmon, acorns, and uh, there are a lot of bulb plants that grow around here, onions, um, the calicortis, the cat's ears and stuff that, 
you know, they dig up all these bulbs and mash them together and, you know, eat those and everything. But like, have you ever done that? It's a lot of work. Um, you yeah. know, it's like, it can be done. You know, it's interesting. Those, those plant types, those plant community types are adapted to what? One drought because they're storing mm -hmm. water in their bulbs. But, but what was the other feature that was distinct? That's distinct about that particular area is fire. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that, that place has been a fire ecology, a fire economy forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. Really and has. The, the oaks. One, one of the, the, the uh, question I was going to ask you, um, uh, I've done a certain amount of research and I keep finding references and the, the species over and over, this one species uh, hits uh, as the top choice over and over again. Which uh, single perennial species in the USA uh, has the most species diversity of associates that hang out with it. Other plants that live with it, other animals that live with it, insects, amphibians, reptiles, etc. And and this one species keeps coming up as the top over and over and over and over and over again. What species is that? Um. Well, um, immediately I'd want to say an oak of some sort. Um, but I don't know if that's the case, but I know oaks can, depending on where they are and what species can support a ton of biodiversity. Yep. It was, it was the oaks, nice. you know, the okay. oaks Good. in North America, ding, 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 ding. It, it rules the biodiversity. <laughs> <laughs> you get a star in the middle of your forehead. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so let's, let's start there. You know, if you're in an area where there are any oaks at all, naturally, natively, let's start by restoring oaks. Oaks are able to go out into, and they're fire mm -hmm. yep. uh, dependent, they're fire tolerant. You can burn the top off of an oak year after year yep. after year, and the root gets a little bit bigger every year, a little yep. bit bigger every year. And then if a couple of years goes by without a fire, then the bark's tough enough and it doesn't bother it. And that root just keeps going down. It stores water in its body. They take a lot of moisture out of the air. You notice the underside of the leaves have a little fuzz on them, and that captures moisture right out of the atmosphere. They're an amazing plant. Totally amazing plant. They really are. You know, it's and incredible. so let's go to let's go to soil. There's all kinds of emphasis on soil these days. Oh, it's all about the soil. Oh, we can win the world with soil. soil. It's like, uh, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's talk, let's talk to these trees that you see growing out of the cliffs now. <laughs> Who did all this the soil preparation there? Who actually increased the organic matter in the soil? Uh, you know, who did the cover crops for five years? Who did the mineral balance? Nobody. Acorn got stuffed in a crack by a blue jay or something like that, and that tree managed to survive another year. What it does is its leaves photosynthesize. They take carbon out of the atmosphere and they make carbon chains. Yep. Carbon yep. chains are called sugars. So it's basically taking sugar right out of the atmosphere and it oozes it out into its roots. And then all of the bacteria and mm -hmm. fungi and these little microfauna start eating all these sugars and they poop and they pee and they eat each other. And then the plant root goes and eats up all that excrement. That tree makes the soil. The ecosystems that we plant are what actually create the soil. And so we don't need deep, dark, rich soil, compost, biochar, all that kind of bullpucky. We need to plant the uh, plant community types that are adapted to this area and help them through time, yeah. help keep them established. They make the soil. Then what happens when all of a sudden you get this canopy of green over you um, on a hot, sunny day? Isn't it nice to go in under the shade? Yep. It's cooler, isn't it? It's less temperature. Now think about the difference between the shade of an umbrella. You wear them, you put up an umbrella, and the sun doesn't shine on you. It's shadier. It's cooler. Um, but what you have not done is you have not decreased the overall heat in the right. atmosphere. You've just reflected it away from you. Whereas if you take a tree, whatever it is that's in light that causes this photosynthesis to happen, not only are you taking carbon out of the atmosphere, you're taking the heat itself and have to heat up this whole entire tree, you are removing the photons from the atmosphere. They can no longer contribute to heating up the atmosphere. The photons themselves mm -hmm. are now incorporated into biomass. Um, so all these space reflector stuff and all that blah, blah, they can't compete yeah. with what a tree actually, actually does. They're actually sequestering the photons, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really really good way to to put that, and I hadn't really thought about it quite in that uh, in that way before. But you're you're absolutely right. You're not just 
shielding yourself from the sun, but you're using the sun. <laughs> you're, you're using the light. Yeah. And we're sucking it right up. Yeah. We're sucking it right up. That's right. Yeah. And uh, going back to your experience building New Forest Farm, because I'm thinking about, you know, it's like you get these elements in place and you recognize the ecosystems that you're building. For, for you, when you were first doing all of this, how long did it take before some of these systems started to get mature to the point um, that they were, I guess, productive economically. So like, as you're trying to like make a business and, you know, and all of that, uh, what did that look like? Here's the whole point. Here's the whole point. The first year, the first year, that's why they call it a business. Yeah. If that business isn't making money, you're out of business, you're done. Yep. So what happens in the early years, um, I started with what are called the agroforestry techniques Alley cropping was one of the first. I had a row of trees and a row of trees, and I grew some sort of annual crop in yeah, between. Yeah. So two years ago, the property would have been corn, beans, corn, beans, corn, beans, corn, beans for like 50, 60 years. All of a sudden, I put in rows of trees, and I, I did some corn. I grew some beans because I could sell them. Um, yeah. Well, then I'd switch to a, you know, I'd start doing cover crops with, with uh, winter grains. Mm -hmm. I could harvest the winter mm -hmm. grains and sell that. Or I just use that as a plow down for fertilizer for produce crops. So in the early years, I had a lot more annual crops that I did. I probably, at the most, I did about 12 acres of, of annual vegetables. My first perennial vegetable was asparagus. Uh, the best thing I ever did was to plant asparagus. I did the <laughs> same thing that I mentioned with the, uh, with the trees. I wanted asparagus crowns. Look in the catalog, $2.25 a crown. It's like, and I need 20,000 crowns. I don't have that kind of money. But if I buy 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, if I buy 100,000 crowns, I get them delivered for 35 cents a piece, bam, all I got to do is sell 70,000 yep. um, asparagus crowns. And so you just start going around to all these different people around you. And how I marketed my produce, um, I joined this little cooperative of, at the time, with six other produce growers. And we would all pool our produce together to put it on a pallet to go on a truck to send it to Chicago. And that little produce co-op that started, uh, you know, 1988 was when it got started. I joined in 1994. Um, that little produce co-op is uh, Organic Valley. Ah. And it's now over a billion dollars in, over wow. a billion dollars in sales since, since um, uh, 2015. And so how about we actually do work together? Yeah. What if we did that? Massive rural economic development because – the largest private employer in the southern half of the state of Wisconsin is Organic Valley. Yeah. Because we actually grow stuff. We actually pool our resources together. We actually sell it. And we, we take wholesale prices for it. We're not getting a million dollars per pound. Yeah. So in the early years, uh, uh, annual produce was the, the mainstay of my uh, economy. Then as the nursery sales increased, I shifted more towards nursery sales. And then I start having my own seeds from my own trees. So now I've got genetics that I'm now uh, I'm managing my herd and selecting for a specific trait. So I have my own strains of chestnuts and hazelnuts mm -hmm. and pine nuts and so on. Um, and then as time goes on, I only have uh, about maybe two acres of annual crops in the ground right now. And it rests as perennial out of 110 acres. So it started that my, my cash flow was mostly annuals and it's transitioned through time that now it's, you know, 98, 95, 98% perennials. Wow. Nice. It yeah. takes time. Yep. It's faster. Uh, Cause um, uh, my helper who's been to um, Tanzania with me uh, where we've, we've done quite a bit of work with schools uh, and orphanages, helping them set up systems over there. It was like four years Boom. You know, it's like wow. 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, you know, beautiful tropical weather. It's like 90 during the day, 70 at night, <laughs> 90 during the day, 70 nights. Things grow like crazy. Right. Yeah. Wow. And so within four years, they, they went from, you know, rocks and sand to, to a, a beautiful, um, you know, it's a, like a, like a dry tropical forest because it has like nine months with no rain and then you have a rainy season and then nine months with no rain. 
Um, so it'll be different no matter where you are. And I was just up in uh, Alaska at some of my properties up in Alaska. And there are there are pine nut trees that I planted 25 years ago that are finally chest high. <laughs> so that's it's a little bit slower, a little bit slower up there too. That you know, water is going to be a limiting factor. It's, it, too much or too little is going to slow her down or speed up that system. Too much heat, not enough heat will slow down or speed up your system. Daylight, a lot of people don't realize daylight is more usable daylight in Alaska for growing of crops. Because like summertime, it, I mean, it, was, it wasn't even summertime, it was May, there was still snow on the ground in places, and it never got yeah, dark. Yeah. It, would be, it would be dusky for a few hours at night, but it never got dark. And you imagine a cabbage never stops growing. Just right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's a, that's a really good point for anyone listening. That's like inspired and, and trying to, you know, figure out how to work towards this kind of stuff, realizing that everyone's unique situation is just that unique as far as where they are. Um, and so I guess uh, it's, it's good for people to, ha to, well, I mean, you need to understand your local ecology anyway to know what you're going to be doing. But even from the perspective of knowing um, how to tamper your expectations um, so that you kind of have some sense of, of what it's going to take to, to, uh, to get to that point and how, you know, like you were saying, these transitionary periods you go through and what crops you focus on and how you take advantage of the land that you're working with and the resources you have while everything is going through those successional changes and getting to this kind of new stage that you're um, that you're aiming for. And it's going to change. It's going to change always. Yeah. Uh, and and what will have to happen is you will have to make decisions. At one point in time, I was selling like a, a whole boatload of cut flowers, mostly daffodils, because um, I. I followed one of the directions in the permaculture designer's manual and planted daffodils ah, around fruit trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's incredible. They're, they're poisonous to uh, rodents, so you don't get hardly any bark damage from nibbling you know, rodents. Uh, and they make these cut flowers or these yep. flowers that uh, they flower three weeks before the apples do. And then <laughs> all of the bees, wild bees and honeybees as well, come in there and they, they utilize They're coming to your apple orchard uh, getting all the pollen, nectar, and then they lay their first flush of eggs. How long does it take bees, apis species, to have the second generation? Three weeks. You've just increased your population of pollinators right in time for the apples. Wow. So one one point in time, I was I was selling a boatload of, of daffodils. Well, then as my asparagus started to, to come into production, I started picking after the second year. And then by year four or five or so, I was getting way more money out of the asparagus than I was the daffodils. And so I just made the choice to focus on the asparagus and just not really focus all that much on the daffodils. And, you know, with, with, with our plants, they need a, a little mm -hmm. bit of care. They don't need a whole lot of care. And I mean, there's still oodles of daffodils all over the farm, everywhere. There's some places they're spreading, other places they're petering out. Um, and they're beautiful. And they're incredible. And anytime during daffodil season, I want to just, you know, impress somebody. I pick like a five-gallon bucket right. with the daffodils yeah. and drive downtown and go, hey, here. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Just here. take them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's so awesome, we can, Matt. We can plant can design that kind of abundance and we can have that kind of abundant life and we can have these beautiful random experiences of, of joy yeah. and happiness and unexpected. Wow. I was having a bad day and this guy came by, and gave me five gallons of daffodils. Whoa. Well, that's, that's something I was, I was going to point out is that, um, and maybe this is a good way to, to start to, to bring everything together. But, you know, like we started out saying like, it's not just about agriculture, it's about culture and and how we sustain ourselves and live on this planet um but recognizing that a, a piece of that is yeah setting up these potential moments of community and and happiness and sharing um is is a really important thing to take into consideration um you know growing up in a rural area of myself i mean i love you know like harvest festivals and uh, different things like that that bring communities together around the local farms. I always liked that. But even 
like you're saying, just these little bits of like, hey, I've got all of these amazing, beautiful flowers. Like, just take them and have a great day. You know, um, these just little moments to just improve our time that we're spending here on this planet. And, and not just getting these moments of happiness, but knowing that those moments of happiness are tied into, are rooted into uh, a system that helps ensure that, um, you know, ultimately we're, we're building something that will, you know, help humans keep persisting and keep spreading happiness well into the future, um, you know, along with our, our wild neighbors uh, that we share all of this with. Um, I think is a it's a great great outlook to have on all of this. And and I suppose if there's there's kind of one thing that I've I've been you know like sent here for or whatever I I can't do everything you know that I'm not even competent enough hardly to take care of my own you know stuff and keep that together. But if if I can do anything to you know encourage people, inspire people, uh, to bite people in the butt to make you know get them to do it, uh, to recruit. I think what we need now is for individuals to say, I, in my own life, mm -hmm. from now on, everywhere I go, I am going to do my best to improve the health and the, and the quality of this natural ecosystem where I live, whether it means planting trees or, you know, or harvesting water, whatever it means with whatever resources that you have, no matter where you are, we can make this world a better place for real not by being a like monger on Facebook and not by petitioning the government or overthrowing it, whatever your flavor is. We can do it actually by planting food systems that are based on natural realities, actual realities. And we can now have a true ecological abundance from which we can share with others, trade with others, sell with others. We have a real economy and a real culture based on how this planet actually works. Um, looking for people who are willing to stand up and say, yeah, that's what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that do step up, and maybe this will be the last question, but uh, for those that are listening maybe today mm -hmm. or whoever's listening to this on the day you're listening to it, and they decide, yes, that is you know, how I want to move forward, what is some advice you would have to those, especially uh, people that maybe have no a uh, real background in agriculture or even being outside. I mean, let's uh, take into consideration there are just tons and tons of people on the planet that really have very little connection um, to nature or the outside. And um, and I think part of that is, is what's helping the regenerative agriculture movement, you know, grow like it is because people are rec kind of feeling that desire to reconnect and, and, and everything like that. Uh, what would be your advice for for people to to learn more and and sort of get started on this journey? You know, you mentioned you know making that decision about consumption, um, you know, and, and changing what you consume and that sort of thing. But also just like learning uh, resources and that sort of thing, books, you know, whatever. Uh, what are some things that you would recommend to people to kind of get them on on a good track? So, so, of course, I do recommend starting where you are, mm -hmm. and at some point in time, hopefully most of us will eat another meal. Yeah. When you have that meal, say, well, where did this come from? You know, where was it grown? Was it, you know, manufactured in a factory? Was it actually grown by human beings, harvested by human beings? Well, where was, where was it grown? How was it grown? Who harvested it? You know, what, what's all the social justice associated with this, this chain of the supply of this food coming on my plate how can i change that to make the world a better place and start making those choices find out who your local farmers market folks are and you know and if you can't afford to buy the you know foods there offer to work for them helping them clean up and tear down their booth at the end of the day to get some stuff or get some stuff that was bruised or fell on the floor cut off the you know cut off the bruised part and and, and get some of that food that way then start learning um uh, for a great general overview on how I've approached it and what I've done on, on my property, um, go to Acres USA. I think it's AcresUSA.com and then search for Restoration Agriculture. That's my, that's my first book. Yep. I'm going to have a, have a series of books now. If you've already read those, you have a little bit of an understanding of the, uh, of the approach of a restoration agriculture. One of the things that you really 
Um, I think everybody does need to know is we need to understand how the life systems on this planet work. So we need a basic understanding of, of ecology. I think everybody uh, who gets out of, you know, any kind of public school system or private school system for that matter, we all should have a basic understanding on how this planet works, you know, ecological systems. Um, what I've done is I've taken um, uh, college level uh, terrestrial ecology curriculum and then adapted it to uh, what if you have a piece of property and you want to mm -hmm. do some sort of restoration agriculture farm, what are the principles behind what it is that we do? And that's available online at restoring ag restoringagriculture.com. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a, a <laughs> land manager's guide to terrestrial ecology is, is basically what it is. And it, this is not this is not like take apples, right? Yeah. We grow apples in our system. If you look at where my apples are, it's not an orchard. <laughs> an orchard is a concept. It's this intellectual idea that when we plant apples in this orchard, all of a sudden a bug comes in. It's a pest. We have a problem. <laughs> it's like, well, wait, insects and apples, that's called normal. Yeah. That's the way nature works. Well, the reason why you have a problem is because you planted nothing but apples and they go in there and they populate like crazy. Well, that your first problem was that you're trying to plant an orchard instead of an ecosystem. And if you have an ecosystem with all these different other species that are in there, you've got checks and balances, predators and prey relationships, um, you know, disease that goes after the pests, insects and diseases that go after diseases and so on. So the, the uh, restoring agriculture um, course is about the ecological principles behind these certain restoration agriculture practices that we do. Um, if you're just interested in purchasing edible uh, woody crops, trees and shrubs and vines and so on, go to forestag.com. Or if you have some uh, property and you would like to have help um, conceptualizing how you would set up your farm, some basic design and layout, or even construction and installation, contact Restoration Agriculture Development. Um, all of that's available online somewhere. That's excellent, yeah. But whatever it, is, whatever it is, start today, and this is something that we're going to be doing the rest of our lives, one step yeah. at a time, yeah. one day at a time. We can't solve all the problems all at once, and as soon as we pro solve some, more are going to come up. But if we right. make yeah. one mistake... If we make one mistake, let it be the mistake that we converted this place where we are back into more of a resemblance of what it was when it was healthy, you know, maybe 200, 300, 400 years ago. If, yeah. that, if we make one mistake, I think that's a good one. I, I agree. I think that's a, a mighty fine mistake to make. Um, and in general, you know, it's, I, I, I like that you, you brought in there that, um, there will always be more surprises and and other things that that <laughs> pop up. That's that's definitely true. You never know what uh, <laughs> what route uh, things are going to take. Um, but that's all excellent, and I'll make sure to get links from you for all of that stuff too to put into the show notes and everything, so people can just um, click that and and dive off into that. But Mark, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, it's been a delight for me. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time today. And I just thank you for all the great work that you've done and are continuing to do um, to educate people and show people that, um, you know, there are um, better ways to, to move forward and how we live on this planet and, um, and that it's possible that these things are not just theories, not just ideas but we can do it. All right. Roots in the ground. Roots in the ground. That's right. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. Um, if you want to learn more about Isn't Life Curious, just find us at isn'tlifecurious.com and we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of the social medias. Um, you can find us there. But with that, everyone out there, stay curious and take it easy. Want to get early access to the next episode of Isn't Life Curious? Donate today and get access to members-only perks like early episodes, behind-the-scenes content, exclusive merch, private events, and more at patreon.com slash isn't life curious. Isn't Life Curious is produced by Natural Learning Enterprises. 
a mission-driven education company focused on developing engaging educational experiences that promote critical thinking skills and enhance public scientific literacy about life in the natural world. Learn more about Natural Learning Enterprises at naturaledu.com. And if you like Isn't Life Curious, please consider checking out some of these other programs and shows from Natural Learning Enterprises. Come on, Molly! It'll be an adventure! Phoebe called out as she followed Brother Toadstool. Brother Toadstool led Phoebe and Molly into a tunnel that went deep down into the ground. As they climbed into the tunnel, they found themselves getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Our new children's book, A Toadstool's Treasures, takes young readers on an adventure into the fun and fascinating world of fungi. Learn more and find mycology-related learning resources, games, and lesson plans for teachers and homeschooling families at toadstoolstreasures.com. It's a plant that goes by many names. Some call it hemp. Some call it marijuana. Call it what you will, it's cannabis. And it's got a lot of people curious. Tune in to the Curious About Cannabis podcast to join scientist and educator Jason Wilson on a journey to explore critical questions about the world's most controversial plant. Hey everybody, this is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in again. Featuring contributions from leading researchers, doctors, and industry veterans alike. We went on and on with these rational arguments, and they went nowhere. Well, the main problem, again, is ignorance, just lack of awareness, and this is across the board. What we started doing was gathering all this information, making a very big database, and deciding what the most important factors are uh, that are relevant to people who consider using cannabis. They are ready to hear, how can this plant help me? The discovery of the endocannabinoid system is certainly worthy of a Nobel Prize in medicine because of the research that it has sparked. Prepare to transcend the hype as we uncover lasting insights about cannabis. The Curious About Cannabis podcast. Available now at cacpodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts.